Hello everyone. Welcome you all to the AFIC webinar. My name is uh, Tiparat, Aquaculture Officer of FAO <coughs> Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. I'm your moderator. We will be together for two hours and a half. Um, let me introduce the topic to you. Today, uh, uh, we will have this webinar as one of the AFIC webinar series. I will introduce you very briefly about the context of this webinar and introduce you to our resort person and their topics. Uh, this AFIC webinar series uh, contain nine webinars. This is number three of the webinar. So you can register for more uh, throughout this year. Uh, in partnership with our colleague in InfoFish, Office Secretariat had developed a technical webinar series based on the work program and the priority of the region. Webinars open to register participants and webinars are recorded and will be made available for viewing online. The objective of this webinar number three on AMR we seek to raise awareness, share experiences, knowledge on AMR in aquaculture to better understand the challenges and help boost the global and regional effort to raise the use of antibiotics. The WHO declared that AMR has emerged as one of the principal public health problem in the 21st century. There are uh, several social and economic impacts that I would like to highlight. This is based on the study called No Time to Waste uh, with multi partner developed this uh, paper. It mentioned that mortality from AMR related to health issues is spread at 700 700,000 human beings a year. This could lead up to 10 million annually by 2050. By 2030, AMR could force up to 20 million people into extreme poverty due to its combined effects on human health and food system. Factors involved in the spread of AMR are as follows, human medicine in the hospital, human medicine in the community, from livestock, crop production, and aquaculture production, and also in our environment allow us. Concern over misuse and abuse of therapeutics in aquaculture triggered by seafood safety worries from trade to human, to health, human health. These are our resort person and the presentation topics. First, we have Dr. Melba, FAO expert. She will give an update on global work to address AMR in aquaculture. Followed by uh, my colleague, Wemin Miao. He will, he also from FAO in Rome. He will give an overview on AMR in the in Asia and the Pacific region. And next, expert from China, Professor Ehua Ri from uh, the Institute of Hydrology in, China, in Beijing, in, in, in Wuhan, and Professor Itya from India, uh, Nite University will share experiences on mitigation of AMR in India. And our last speaker, Dr. Eduardo Liano from Naga, uh, an expert on AMR. He will describe the gap and challenges and outline policy recommendations on mitigating AMR and promoting the prudent use and less possible use of AMR. Each presentation will be 15 minutes continue without interruption. 
And next session after that presentation is the Q&A. Dr. Bin Hao from FAO Rome will moderate this session. Some questions may be answered by our speakers in the Q&A box. Some will be selected for the Q&A session. And the last session is for each panelist to give conclusion and final remarks. This is all from my side, and I would like a colleague in uh, Info Fish to uh, provide some instruction on Zoom arrangement. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Tiparat, for the introduction. I welcome all the participants uh, in the APIC webinar number three uh, on AMR. And today's uh, our topic is antimicrobial resistance is simple to under understand, and yet it is often misunderstood. Uh, <clears throat> InfoFish is delighted to be part of this important webinar series. And I would like to uh, give you a reminder for all the participants for the some of the housekeeping guidelines, that is the guideline for the panelists and uh, by which uh, the webinar session will be by which uh, for the uh, fruitful and the interactive uh, discussion uh, of this webinar session. Uh, all the participants can uh, ask questions by using the question answer tab, uh, which is at the bottom of the screen. And our moderator will select some of the questions and will address to the uh, our Beirut speakers after all the presentations. And due to time constraints, we will not answer all the questions. And uh, we hope uh, you will be, uh, we will be here with us. And regarding the chat box, we, we are using one, uh, here is a chat function here. And uh, we will not, uh, this chat room is not moderated. And uh, we, we request you kindly limit your technical messages here and do not, uh, uh, for the security purposes, do not uh, click on the link that is appearing here. And uh, also for the survey questions, uh, you will receive uh, four survey questions and we appreciate if you could respond to these uh, survey questions, which will be uh, helpful for us. And next, after. And regarding the presentations and the webinar recording, yes, uh, this uh, webinar recording will be uh, available on the InfoFish YouTube channel, uh, of which the link is appearing here. And uh, the presentations also will be, uh, will be uh, appearing on this link. And we will be sharing the link on the chat box while during the webinar session. And uh, we also, uh, do apologize that like other epic webinars we are not uh, we have no arrangement of providing certificate of participation of this webinar so we are very so sorry for that and having said that uh, i would like to thank all the participants who are joining from different part of the globe and uh, i would like to uh, hand over uh, my uh, I, I would like to hand over to dr tipar thank you all yeah can we now start with the first presentation? Dr. Melba, you have the floor, please. Yeah, yeah, please. Thank you. With this, uh, finding the main screen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? please. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, so can you see my screen now? It's blank. Uh, it's blank, yes. Blank, okay, hold on. Move to the first slide first. Yeah, can you see it now? Yes. No, first yes. Slide, yes. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, 
Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I am very pleased to participate in this webinar on antimicrobial resistance. I will talk about AMR from the global perspective and also a little bit on uh, AMR in aquaculture. So what is AMR and why is it a global food challenge? AMR refers to the ability of microorganisms such as bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites to persist or grow in the presence of drugs, also called antimicrobials, that are designed to inhibit or kill them. When microorganisms become resistant to antimicrobials, standard treatments are often ineffective, and in some cases, no drugs provide, can provide effective therapy. Consequently, treatments fail, and this increases illness and mortality in humans, animals, and plants. For agriculture, including um, aquaculture, the impacts are production losses, damage to livelihoods, and it also jeopardizes food security. Moreover, AMR can spread among different hosts in the environment and antimicrobial resistant microorganisms can contaminate the food chain. It is now a major global threat of increasing concern to human and animal health, and it has also implications for food safety, food security, and the economic well-being of millions of farming households. So what causes microbes to acquire AMR? Microbes become resistant to antimicrobials because of random mutations, and bacteria can acquire the blueprint for resistance uh, genes from other bacteria. So sharing of genes that confer resistance to antimicrobials is common among, among bacteria. When my antimicrobials in humans or animals are used or are present in the environment, the microbes that lack the resistance are inhibited or are killed, and the resistant microbes are able to outcompete the microbes and become the dominant members of the population. In other words, the use of um, antimicrobial antimicrobials drives the selection for antimicrobial resistant populations. So you will see in this graph it, the routes by which antimicrobial resistant bacteria and, re and resistant genes can cycle through human populations, terrestrial and aquatic systems. So for the pathway for uh, human population and terrestrial environment could be through sewage effluent, hospital waste, agricultural runoff, direct contact with livestock and humans and wildlife. On the other hand, the uh, pathway for this um, antimicrobial resistant bacteria or resistant genes to reach, for example, from aquatic systems to terrestrial environment could be through irrigation, animal drinking water, precipitation, and birds. And the uh, pathway from aquatic systems to human populations could be through food, potable water, fish keeping, baiting, and leisure. So these are some, um, the use of veterinary drugs in um, aquaculture production, both has benefits and issues. And I have listed here a few of the benefits. The first one is uh, with respect to uh, development of culture techniques for new species. Uh, as you know, there's always a lag phase between identification and characterization of pathogens and the development of disease control measures or procedures. And the use of these drugs may be necessary to ensure the viability of new species until alternative control measures can be incorporated into production and health management uh, programs. Second is the in terms of failure of preventive therapy. Um, good husbandry and vaccination do not always ensure the success of the enterprise. Uh, farmed aquatic animals that are subjected to stress beyond their endurance capacity can lead to depressed immune systems and compromised uh, non-specific barriers, for example, skin, which serve as the first line of defense, thus enhancing susceptibility to pathogens that may only be resolved through these drugs. The third is the emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases that 
brought that's that are brought about by irresponsible global trade has resulted to what we call as tran transboundary aquatic animal diseases. And the use of these drugs in combination with other biosecurity measures may restrict the geographical spread of infections. Changes in culture and environment, environmental conditions this pertain to the use of circulation technologies, higher impact densities, um, use, uh, chronic use of antimicrobials to control diseases and high concentrations of farms in limited geographical areas. These conditions may change the manner in which pathogens and farm species interact. And diseases may manifest themselves in ways that require rapid diagnosis and treatment. The last is animal welfare. It's gaining uh, increasing importance in both terrestrial and aquatic production systems. Treatment is often necessary for the well being of animals in question. There are also issues in the use of veterinary medicines, and I have listed at least four of them. This is diagnostic issues pertain to the need for rapid and accurate diagnosis of pathogens prior to initial treat, initiating treatment. There is also the need to promote the use of susceptibility testing using internationally standard. Uh, standardized protocols to ensure that the antibiotic that is applied will be effective against the strain of the pathogen that causes the disease. Uh, in terms of human and animal health issues, the adverse health effects that might occur in human populations are those associated with the presence of residues in food products or with the development of resistance in bacteria associated with human disease. AMR and residues of banned substances in products are two of the most important hazards. In terms of environmental and ecological issues, this relate to the release of medicines into the aquatic environment through leaching from un unconsumed feed, feeds, international, inten intentional or unintentional release of effluent waters from aquaculture facilities and the presence of residues in fecal materials. The impacts on local ecosystems are in general poorly studied, but it may include concerns about accumulation of residues in sediments and the impacts of these drugs and chemicals on the natural biota, including possible development of AMR in aquatic bacteria. Concerning legislation and enforcement issues, countries need to have appropriate policies and well-conceived legislation and regulations regarding the use of veterinary medicines in aquaculture, including aspects of procedures for registration of drugs, uh, licensing of uh, professionals, extra label use, and record keeping. We have produced this uh, FAO, what we call as FAO Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries Technical Guidelines. It is voluntarily, but they emphasize the need for commitment and collaboration among uh, all stakeholders. It provides guidance on the use of veterinary medicine in aquaculture and uh, also recommendations for prudent use targeting governance authorities and non-state actors. So what is being done? Uh, currently, AMR is receiving high level attention and uh, high level attention. And uh, I, I'm just showing you here the timeline of the uh, UN-wide attention that was is giving to this subject. So in 2015, when the World Health Organization uh, released the global plan of action and it was approved by during the 68th world health assembly that was in 2015 and the assembly also urged members to develop national action plans on amr and to have it in place in by 2017 and at the same time uh, following the uh, release of the global plan of action oi is 83rd general assembly and the fao's uh, 39th conference has uh, endorsed and supported the global plan of action. 
In 2016, the 21st UN General Assembly convened a high-level meeting on AMR, and this has led to the establishment of the tripartite composed of OIE, uh, FAO, and WHO under the One Health collaboration. And subsequently, on the same year, both FAO and OIE had released their action plans or strategies on the prudent use of antimicrobials. In 2017, the United Nations Secretary General convened the interagency coordination group that is tasked to provide high level advice and they are re reporting uh, directly to the Secretary General of the UN. So under this one health collaboration, uh, the General Assembly had called upon the tripartite and other in intergovernmental organizations to support the development and implementation of national action plans and AMR activities at the national, regional, and global levels with uh, FAO as the global leader for uh, agriculture, OIE as the global leader for animal health and welfare standards, and WHO as the global leader for uh, human health. The um, the tripartite has developed a work plan that focuses on five areas. First is the implementation of the National Action Plan on AMR. Second, awareness and behavioral change. Third, surveillance and monitoring of AMU and AMR. Stewardship and optimal use of antimicrobial agents and monitoring and evaluation. So the tripartite also recognized the need for UNEP to join this collaboration. The tripartite also established a multi-partner trust fund to secure consistent and coordinated financing for a five-year period. Okay, so here I would like to, for us to take a closer look at the aquaculture component of a country national action plan. We examined 80 NAPs. They are publicly available at the WHO website and we are pleased to report some of the positive findings. Among the top uh, aquaculture producers, nine countries, these are China, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Norway, Myanmar, Philippines, Japan, and South Korea. They had aquaculture component in the country now. Um, three countries, Bangladesh, Chile, and Thailand, they, they uh, in their country naps, aquaculture is being discussed and three countries, Egypt, Israel, and Ecuador, aquaculture is not yet discussed in the country now. So I think this is good news. This reflects not only the very strong awareness, awareness on AMR, but also concrete actions at the national level. So we have uh, produced a, a guidance document in the development of the aquaculture component of national action plans on AMR and uh, for interested countries may use this guidance. So as you know, FAO is quite active in this area. It is one of the major tripartite partners and uh, it is now our turn to host the secretariat of the tripartite for another year. Uh, it was a member of IACG and its action plan on AMR for the next five years is the in the approval process. We have produced a number of guidance documents, one each in 2005, 2012, and 2019, three in 2020, and a few more are coming in 2021. Also because of the pandemic, we continue to develop virtual training modules. One specifically on AMR is coming soon with partners and under the auspices of the FAO eLearning Academy. Some of you may also be familiar with Globefish that contains information and analysis on world trade. It has contains market reports, trade information, and there is a dedicated page on border rejections and food safety legislation of several countries, which may be relevant to AMR. We are also finalizing this document on aquaculture biosecurity best practice guidance to reduce AMR. So the idea is to use this 10 point best practice as 
a biosecurity landscape. So these points are know your host, know your pathogens, know your systems, know your contamination pathway, source healthy seed, maintain good husbandry, use antimicrobials, prudently respect food safety, respect the environment, and implement a biosecurity plan. Biosecurity activities and the risk mindset should be an everyday practice. You may also um, remember this Sinesco circle or the what is known also as the epidemiological triad that shows the interaction between a pathogen and susceptible population in a suitable environment that allows the transmission of the pathogen and the development of disease in the population. But please remember also that the pathogen must be present for the disease to occur, but its presence may not always result a disease. Okay, so can I pause to have a drink? So knowing your pathogens, how they are being managed through treatment or good husbandry or other options, they are all important. And you will find in this table some 40 bacterial pathogens and of some of the most important farmed aquatic species. They belong to some uh, 10 groups of diseases. Those in red are reported from tropical regions, temperature ranging between 20 and 37 degrees. And some of them are zoonotic, those that you can see in red and bold. So I'd like to end my talk with the following message that Better understanding is essential. And with this understanding, it will be easier to move forward towards a coordinated and integrated actions. Aquaculture biosecurity and AMR may be complex and they are driven by many interconnected factors. Single isolated interventions have limited impact. Greater innovation and investment are required in research and development of new antimicrobials, vaccines, other alternatives to antimicrobials, and of course, diagnostic tools. Um, aquaculture producing countries need to develop the aquaculture component. And for those who have already done is to implement the country national action plans on AMR. We need better understanding of AMR in aquaculture and its coordinated into integration into the One Health uh, approach. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Melbar, for your uh, presentation. Uh, we can see that th there are lots of uh, global work uh, under this uh, topic, AMR and AMU. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, my colleague Mia Wei Min to focus on the regional uh, activities that going have been going on so far. So we will hear more how the, reg the region put their effort to ensure that the fish is safe to eat. Mia, you have the floor. Thank you. Please. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Very yes, clear. Please. Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening upon where you are, everybody. Uh, first of all, I wish to thank a few colleagues in Bangkok and InfoFish for inviting me to participate and make a presentation at this uh, regional webinar, which is of great importance to aquaculture sector and also public health. And it's also very timely organized. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm not a technical person specialized in aquatic animal health and AMR. But as the airfield aquaculture officer uh, based in the Asia Pacific region for nearly a decade, I joined and initiated uh, some early activities related to the uh, AMR associated uh, with aquaculture. So I'm very glad to share my uh, perspective on AMR in the Asian Pacific context from point of view of uh, aquaculture people. So the, the presentation is basically to uh, provide a original overview on the relevance of aquaculture. So the 
the major objective is one is to highlight the relevance, the importance of F AMR to aquaculture sector in the region. And the other hand, want to share or to introduce some little bit information on the overall status of the region in addressing AMR associated with aquaculture. So the presentation will cover basically the importance of sustainable aquaculture growth in the Asian Pacific, because we are talking about AMR associated with aquaculture, then we have to understand why we're, we're doing this. Then try to identify some important relevance of AMR to the aquaculture development in the region, and uh, to introduce to very briefly to touch on some effort and progress have, that have been made at the regional level and uh, at the country level. To highlight some major challenges in effectively tackling AMR issue in aquaculture in the region. And finally, to uh, provide some thought on the way forward. That was particularly the, the recommendation from a regional uh, consultation on AMR in aquaculture. So uh, when we talk about AMR in aquaculture, so first we need to understand the sector, how the sector has developed and how is the contribution of the sector development. So this graph clearly show in the past four decades, how aquaculture has grown and what we have achieved. So by 2018, the region produced a total 105 million tons of aquaculture products. So that is a historical high production. So in four decades period, the production increased by nearly 17 folds through the average annual production growth of 7.53%. So compared with all food production sectors, that is a very, very outstanding kind of achievement and growth. So currently the region uh, share 92% of the global total aquaculture production in 2018, uh, compared with what was 86, 40 years ago. So not in the, only in the absolute quantity increase, but also in the uh, total share in, of the of global production. So in addition to the, to the quantity of the aquaculture products we produce, we can see their economic value of such growth uh, of the sector. So in 2018, the total value of the aquaculture products reached 225 billion US dollars. So in the past three decades, this value increased by 11 folds. And currently we contribute 85.5% of the global aquaculture output value in 2018, which is also much higher than 30 years back. That was 80% in 1988. So this aquaculture development and growth in the production has contributed to the, to the region uh, very, very significantly in different aspects. So first of all, the aquaculture currently contribute to food fish supply in the region of near of over 60%. Compared with about 10% four decades ago, that's a huge achievement. So that is great contribution to the nutrition of the people in, in the region. Then if talk about the per capita fish consumption in 2017, this region, the average consumption is 24.2 kilograms. Compare with the global average, that is only, the rest of the, of the world per capita fish consumption is only 15%. So we are consuming a lot more fish that's largely due to the aquaculture growth in the past. Then eventually it contributes to the people's animal protein intake. We talk about aquaculture only. Now it contributes about 15% in the total 
animal protein intake. Compared with 3% in 1978, that's a huge achievement. So in addition to the contribution to the nutrition food security, the aquaculture sector now make a much greater contribution to the livelihood and the job opportunity in the region. So in 2018, the sector provide nearly 20 million people directly in the farming sector. So that it, we have the farmers, some nearly 20 million. At the same time, because the aquaculture development also bring up the development of other relevant supporting and service, service sectors. So we have more or less equal number of job opportunities are generated from those related supporting and service sectors. Uh, finally, but not the least, the aquaculture development also contribute to certain way to the ecosystem function and also by the So uh, through the aquaculture development, we greatly ease the pressure on the capture fisheries because we can substitute. We don't need to really try so hard to really to catch the fish from the wild. Then some aquaculture activities can also contribute to the enhancement of wild stock, particularly with the aquaculture producer seed. Every year we're releasing large number of the seed into the natural environment. So that can help the restoration of some very declining population in, in the wild. The aquaculture has been developed so well in, in the past, but we are not stopping here. So there's still a need for the sustainable growth of aquaculture sector. So we're now only nine years from the implementation of the 2030 agenda. The FAO is also developing a new strategic framework, which try to provide maximum support to the members to achieve SDG. Particularly, we're focusing on four better, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and a better life. So that, that is our target. So we can see how aquaculture sector are so relevant to that for better. So uh, in general, so sustainable aquaculture growth will contribute to the building a transformative food system. So it will become a very integral part of that system. So the aquaculture is expected to further grow to increase the fish consumption and enhance the nutrition in the region. Even in Asia Pacific, we are con consuming most fish by average, but if we take China out of consideration, we can see the region's fish consumption dropped to only 17 kilograms per capita. Some countries, very big countries like Pakistan, like Bangladesh, the average fish consumption level is still quite low. So there's a lot of work to be done to further to increase the production. Then, Equally important, many countries has taken aquaculture development as an effective approach to contribute to the poverty elevation and the national economy. Then we're also expected to contribute more to the restoration of ecosystem function and services. So all these need the further sustainable growth of, of the sector. So we have the sector here, then we are talking about the AMR. So what is the linkage, particular linkage in this region? So we need to see what is really the character of aquaculture development in Asia Pacific. So basically, there are several major features in the, in the aquaculture sector. One is the intensification. So the aquaculture sector has been growing through largely intensification to the different level. There are drivers actually pushing this intensification. That include developed aquaculture now is more as a livelihood. So when it is a livelihood, we are really aiming high year and a high economic return to make sure we have the farmers have really good income to support their, uh, the house life and food security, everything. 
then the aquaculture now is to produce high quality and a diversity of products that can meet the requirement of mainstream and niche market. So it's, it's very, very different from the past. So we have a much higher requirement to the size, to the quality, and also for the timely delivery of the products. Then this is, Asian Pacific is the most populous region with very limited resources. So people are prompt to improve efficiency in using the limited resources, particularly land and water. So all this requires actually the intensification. It's, it's a very effective approach to meet those kind of requirements. So another feature of the sector is great diversity of the sector. So we highlight two major diversification. One is the species diversity. According to the FAO statistic data, the region currently are culturing some 350 species or species group, which is mainly to meet a diversified market demand. So different consumers, they need different kinds of aquatic products. Then we also did make use of diversified environment and system. So also need a different species. Then we have a most diversified farming system over all kinds of environments. So we have cage, we have a pond, we have a circulation system, we have a rice field, we have a raft. So we have an inland, coastal, marine, so, so diversified. And finally, we see that very, very strong chain of commercialization. So the products are produced more oriented for distant market, domestic, international rather than traditionally the local market. But so all these feature character lead to one consequence, all kind of result. We are, the farmers are facing great challenge or sector facing great challenge to effectively handle aquatic animal disease problem in the aquaculture operation. So compared with other region, so this is much more challenging. So the relevance of AMR to the aquaculture development in the, in the Asian Pacific region. So everybody understand we, if they're engaged in the aquaculture, so bacterial disease is the most common aquatic animal health problem in the aquaculture in this region. Uh, give you an example. In 2005, one a very important literature publication indicated the 43 major bacterial disease in China, the major ones. Uh, we still remember this uh, apens shrimp disease that caused a huge setback of the shrimp industry that is caused by bacteria. On the other hand, the antibiotics are still the most common method used in preventing and control bacterial disease in aquatic animal health, aquatic animals in, in this region, mainly because of two reasons. One, they're very effective, cost effective, and also in terms of treatment effective, then it is very inconvenient to use. So we, the, though there's still a lot of restriction, but there's still quite a most common way to treat the bacteria disease. Another important relevance of AMR to aquaculture is because of the application of antibiotics in treat bacterial disease of aquatic animals is far from efficient, mainly due to the animal we're dealing, due to the environment we're dealing. So we are taking an approach of mainly group treatment or environment treatment instead of individual treatment that is common in the livestock sector, not talking about saying uh, uh, people. So therefore, because of the reason, so there's a great chance of misuse and overuse of antibiotics that may lead to the risk of AMR in, in the aquaculture sector. So this will has well elaborated, will threat the human health through the different pathway. It can threat the ecosystem aquatic biodiversity and threat to the further to the sustainability of the sector. So if we cannot effectively handle this issue, by certain day, we may face, the face this uh, situation. We don't have effective 
medicines to treat our animals, bacterial disease. In addition to these problems, we are also facing other challenges that may intensify or make the AMR issue more uh, difficult or more challenging in, in, the, in the future. So one is the climate change. That is a very common problem we are facing. But if you talk about the climate change, aquaculture, AMR, we can see a very clear linkage. Warming and irregularity of temperature, that's a very common phenomenon under the general context of climate change. So that will increase the chance of occurrence of disease caused by bacteria in, in aquatic environment. Then because of this climate change impact, we can see it will worsen our cultural environment condition, chemical environment, biological environment, and even physical environment. So again, that will increase the frequency and the severity of microbial disease of our cultural animals. Then the intensification is not is unavoidable because we are aiming to produce more with limited, not less, if not less resources. So we are going to see high density, high density of animals in our system. We are going to have a high organic input content level in our environment. Then more and more often we are using outsourced seed and feed, this kind of, of feed materials that can increase the chance of transmission of microbials or further to the disease. And another challenge with this region, there's really lack of effective alternatives to use, to the use of antimicrobials in control animal, aquatic, aquatic animal disease caused by bacteria. Compare with the Europe, we are far behind. Vaccination, very limited. Other alternative drugs, very limited. Despite of all these challenges and, uh, and the problems we are facing, so the region is taking action to move forward. So uh, at the regional level and the country level, effort has been made, progress are achieved in addressing the AMR in the aquaculture uh, sector. So, I just want to list some of the initiative or program are currently undergoing. So FU has already launched a One Health initiative for the Asian Pacific region. That's mainly largely focused on livestock and human, but it first time linked this aquaculture uh, disease problem with the One Health in the general One Health framework. So we Jointly, FAO jointly with uh, NACA organized the first regional consultation on AMR associated with aquaculture in Bangkok in 2018. So we conducted country studies, we had a regional consultation to discuss the, the, the situation, the issues, the challenges, and also the way forward. The several project has been, regional project has been implemented, include uh, the multi-donor supported FAO project to strengthen the uh, capacity, policy, natural action plan on prudent use of, and responsible use of antimicrobials in fisheries, covering largely aquaculture, which is focused more on the AMU and AMR surveillance. So the FAO developed a regional project to support the mitigation for antimicrobial resistance risk associated with aquaculture in the, in the region. So that's target both monitoring surveillance methodology. At the same time, also try to support to build the capacity at the production level to help the farmers to better manage aquatic health. Then uh, with the support of the UK funded uh, Fleming project second phase, the FAO is leading the development of regional AMR monitoring and surveillance guidelines. So that is covering the aquaculture part particularly. So at national level, we see the increasing long list of banned antimicrobials in the aquaculture disease control. 
initially, it's mainly because of the food safety and the residual standard control. But in, as a result, it's also a very important way to, to tackle the AMR in, in aquaculture. So from the uh, country study and also regional consultation, we can see many countries has established regulation on the production, sale, and use of permitted antimicrobials in aquaculture, animal health disease control in aquaculture. So many countries has the regulation laws in place. So most of the country of, in the region recently, they have banned the use of antimicrobial as the growth promotive additive in aqua feed. So that was quite common a few years back. Then we are also glad to see uh, some already 10 countries has already started the pilot surveillance activities on AMR associated with aquaculture. So work are going on going on the ground. So um, we definitely, we see that is a very good, good chance. Uh, still, we are making the progress, but we are still facing a lot of challenges. Uh, according to the regional consultation, it identified the uh, following major challenges uh, in how we can more effectively tackle AMR issues in aquaculture. So it's a lack, still lack of public awareness program on the AMU and AMR. So we talk about all the stakeholders. We do have national awareness program, but if you talk about coverage, it's still very limited. Then the scientific basis for effective addressing AMR pathway in aquaculture and related mechanism is still quite weak. So we don't understand very, very clearly how this AMR actually are moving along the whole system. We have the national regulation in place in many countries. However, the implementation on the ground, it's quite questionable, particularly at farm level, local level, they're not so effective. The region faces the problem difficulty of lack of well-trained personnel to provide good vet veterinary prescription service for in the use of antibiotics to treat the aquatic animal disease. So we don't see like a, like a livestock sector, we don't have many really specialized people. They can advise the farmers, which are a large number of smallholders, how to properly use the antibiotics in, in control the, the bacterial disease. Then the farm labor capacity to improve the aquatic animal health management, to minimize the use of antimicrobial is quite weak. Again, not just to repeat, but just to highlight the still lack of alternatives to ban antimicrobials. So in the past, let's say, at decades or longer, we have banned so many antibiotics, but what is the alternative? We, the farmers that produce the fish not for fun, they're for livelihood. They cannot watch the fish disease without treat them. So if we're not, we're not able to provide alternatives, good alternatives, then it's very hard we can see a great achievement in minimized and prudent use of, of antibiotics. Then we still need more emphasis on good farming management practice. I'm glad to see uh, in Melba's presentation, uh, there's some good practice has already been developed, but the question is how these practices can be really transformed into the ground action by the farmers. There's a lack of harmonized methodology on the MRMU surveillance as well as AMU evaluation. So when we use the uh, antibiotic critics in, in the, on the ground, how they're actually evaluating on their effectiveness, that is questionable. Then the whole aquaculture is, is a very big sector. It was a long supply chain. There's a lack of coordinating uh, along all the stakeholders from the feeding manufacturer, seed producer, farmer, host, harvesting actors, processors, all this link has to cooperate uh, closely to make sure we have concerted effort in addressing this AMR issue. Eventually, we are aquaculture sector is not alone. We have interaction with other sectors. So we don't see much collaboration with other sector, uh, which are using also antibi antibiotics like livestock crop sector. So in their waste management disposal, 
whether they actually get into the aquatic environment and also to affect our sector. Finally, I just want to briefly to share some recommendation from regional consultation on how to move forward or what are the priority to address this MR issue. So that includes number one, further strengthen the MRMU regulation and their enforcement at national and the local level. That's very important. Then to increase MR awareness among all the stakeholders, particularly the public and also the farmers. Then to establish the MRMU surveillance system as a mechanism, as well as to develop required capacity. At the national level, yes, we do have some very good capacity, but local level, particularly some big countries, if you only have one or two uh, national institutions, that's not going to work. So you need to have really a, a very systematic structure uh, of the capacity established. To support the alarm use of alternative, that is again, the priority for the region, the vaccination, we need to really to catch up the other important uh, alternative. Someone has already mentioned it in the, in the uh, Q&A mm. box. This is antimicrobial peptide use, how possibly they become, can become a reality in the region. Then we need to strengthen the farm labor capacity for the good management health. And finally, but not least, to strengthen the research. That is where we need to uh, provide more solid ground for our work in, in the future. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, look forward to the further discussion in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank Over you very you. much, Mio. Mio has provided us uh, with very complete uh, uh, overview of the region, including the challenges and all the activity that uh, have been going on. Now we need to explore more at country level. I would like to invite China and India, please. Ehua. OK, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm very honored to have this opportunity to participate in this webinar to introduce China's practice and experience in curbing bacterial resistance in aquaculture. My name is Li Aihua from Institute of Hydrobiology, Chinese Academy of Sciences. I will present the following three aspects. First of all, let me present some facts about agriculture in China. China's agriculture has several remarkable characteristics, uh, such as we have a very high pro uh, production and a very large agricultural area, too many farm varieties, too many forms of agricultural water bodies, and uh, too many small scale family fish farms, and we also have many fish bacterial passengers and disease. This huge agricultural volume poses a great challenge to MRI management in agriculture settings in China. At least the 20 general of common pathogenic bacteria have been reported. In China, 36 aquatic passengers Seven of them are bacteria, are the subject of routine monitoring and the reporting program. Of course, most of them are a virus. There are 12 kinds of antimicrobial antimicrobials which are allowed to use in aquaculture, but only, only six, six of them are commonly used. Penicillins and the cephalosporins are not permitted. To deal with bacterial disease, various kinds of alternatives to, to antimicrobials uh, to, to antibiotics are widely used in agriculture, such as probiotics, prebiotics, and pre uh, uh, probiotics, including bioflogs and the bacterial phage, herbal medicines. The medicines are used especially as immuno uh, immune modulators. And, and we also have vaccines and uh, 
organic acid is also widely used. Uh, we also have inside in fit enzymes, egg yolk antibodies, antibacterial peptides. Currently, we have eight kinds of licensed fish vaccines in China, but, uh, but not all of them are available in the market. Obviously, compared with the numerous bacterial passengers, these vaccines are far from enough. China has also continued, continually developed and tried the availability of new agricultural technologies over the years, such as rice field, rice field integrated farming and bottom microporous aeration technology and uh, bioflux technology in shrimp couch, and also ecological floating bed technology. Especially different forms of RS are becoming more and more popular in China. And they also have many uh, companies uh, which, uh, which, can, uh, which provide radio kinds of diagnosis kits for fish disease, and they also provide diagnosis service. In the second part, I will introduce the implementation progress of China, China's national action plan in agriculture component. There is an action plan at the national level. In addition, the Ministry, uh, Ministry of Agriculture and the Rural Affairs, uh, let me call it the MARA uh, of the forest. MANA has, also has an action plan specific for MRI issue of animal origin. The national action plan is, uh, is being implemented steadily because we, uh, a series of laws and regulations policies are in place to regular all aspects of veterinary medicine. MARA also uh, has issued a series of policies and uh, decrees, such as uh, we have a list of banned veterinary drugs and the updated veterinary drug quality standards, including the veterinary pharmacopoeia. And we have also five G system of veterinary drugs, GAP, GLP, GCP, GMP, and the GSP. And we also have an updated version of MRL and the withdrawal times for veterinary drugs. We also have a series of good agricultural practice, uh, practice documents. In particular, the use of antimicrobials as feed additives to promote the animal growth has been discontinued since 2020. MALA has printed and disseminated a two-page poster named the Agricultural Medicine Understanding Paper for farmers' references. Uh, this, this two pages contains a lot of information, such as the list of, of approved drug and uh, list of banned drug, uh, prescription drug, and uh, also included prescription drug with short times, and they also have a Q, uh, QR code. This QR code will lead to the National Veterinary Drug Basic Information Database. As for capacity building, China has a com uh, complete aquatic animal disease monitoring, reporting, and uh, prevention control networking covering the whole country. Especially in recent year, MARA requires quarantine of aquatic animal seed at the place of origin. And we also has, uh, have a professional uh, veterinary system, uh, prescription, uh, pres uh, prescription system, at, uh, has a remote diagnosis system for aquatic animal disease. And in China, we also have two FAO, FAO at, uh, uh, MR references the laboratories for agriculture and the two LIE references the laboratories. We are also doing a lot of national routines to deal with fish disease and the MR, such as uh, we have a regular aquatic disease monitoring and the reporting program and the aquatic drug residual surveillance and the monitoring disease monitoring on import and export the aquatic animal. And we also have an aquatic MR surveillance and monitoring program. For this program, we have now 
using commercially customized micro microblast dilution plans uh, uh, for to to set up uh, standardized uh, ST protocol to, uh, to to guarantee the data quality. Mala publishes reports on aquatic animal health in China every year since 2014 in uh, in Chinese and uh, and English. This slide shows the major progress achieved during the past two or three years. Uh, for example, we have taken uh, uh, take actions to reduce the use of drugs, especially antimicrobials in agriculture. And uh, we have stricter regulations on discharge of agricultural wastewater and the promoted deduction or removal of agricultural facilities in larger lakes and uh, reservoirs and promote a shift towards the use of formulated feed as a substitute for wild and the trash fish in agriculture. And we also have a, a stricter regulation on the use of aquatic drugs. For example, the uh, MARA has issued a new policy on agriculture drugs in January 2021. Based on the policy, MARA is developing a wide list of drugs for agricultural use. All inputs outside the list will be strictly banned. This regulation is very tough and uh, possess a huge shock to the aquatic medicine industry. As for uh, uh, awareness, awareness are mainly achieved by various types of training courses and the workshops. And uh, many researchers in China are conducting MR investigations. Here, I will present the MR survey result from a study performed in south of China, Guangdong province. From this table, we can see we can see the resistant rate of most commonly used antibiotics remains at least at the low level. In particular, when we compare the data for three years, 2014, 20 to 2016, we find that resistant rate is not shown an increased threat from year to year. And we can even see some, some sort of decline when, uh, when compare the data of uh, 20, 2016 to uh, 2015. Of course, maybe you have read some different result or conclusion in the literature, but with the, the relatively large number of strains uh, involved in this, uh, in this study and the use of, of the commercially customized the ST plans. And considering this study was performed by a very experienced research team. So I'm sure the data quality of this study was very high and, and these results are very credible. And the third part of my presentation, I will use an example to introduce the practical measures taken to reduce the use of veterinary drugs in agriculture. This is a pilot project. Yeah, it is carried out on, uh, in Anhui province. Uh, this combined measures have proved these combined measures have proved to be very effective because it is consulting in consulting different significant significant reductions in disease incidence and 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 drug use this is this slide shows the result from this pilot project we can see uh, the use of sorry we can see the use of antibiotics decreased by 21 percent in the traditional fish ponds and uh, all decreased by 27% in high value fish ponds uh, when compared with the average data of uh, previous years. In fact, on some farm, antimicrobials uh, are not used throughout the year. So how did they achieve such good results? Let me introduce the measures they have taken. 
at the beginning. So I developed a detailed implementation protocol and set up as per the steering groups and conduct regular inspections and instructions, suggestion uh, and provide the technical service uh, such as disease diagnosis and ST testing service and the providing training courses for fish farmer uh, on the on the good uh, good uh, good agriculture practice and the disease tech control techniques, publicizing the necessity of pollutant use of antimicrobials. Of course, the government also provides some financial support. This is not showing the technical details that I have adopted. Among this, among the, among them, controlling stake density at a reasonable level and the suggestion relation and the use of microbial agents are the most important measures. These pictures are from the project. Uh, you can see the regular ponds. And this is a, a vaccination process. Yeah, this is ecological floating bed in aquaponic ponds. This is ecological farming ponds for crab and uh, crayfish. This is, this is shown suggesting artificial aeration. In this pond, uh, bottom megaporous aeration is working. This is high quality feed. This is purifying and recycling of agricultural waste water using aquatic vegetables and other aquatic plants. This is a uh, this is a harvest fish of high quality. So the above is all I need to present to you. But uh, uh, I'd like to say, uh, in this short 15 minutes, I can't present all the experience we have and all have uh, all we have achieved. So I'd like to expect more communications with others. At the last, I will thank FAO and the National Fisheries Technology Extension Center and the. Uh, Dr. Fung, Dr. Sung, and Mr. Wei. Uh, he is from Anhui Provincial Fisheries Technology Extension Station. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ehua, for this uh, very nice presentation. Thank you. We, we can see uh, a lot of uh, alternatives to um, using antibiotic, antimicrobial in aquaculture. Maybe we can try later uh, do some work together to explore more on each alternative if it can apply in other country in our region here in asia pacific uh, let us hear more from me here from uh, india now dr ipia are you ready yeah thank yeah you. please yeah thank you thank you very much Tiparat, and uh, good day to all the participants so let me start sharing the screen. Uh, yeah, are you able to see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, okay. thank you very much. So I will try to explain the AMR and AMO experience in India. First, to give an idea of the capture and aquaculture uh, production in uh, India, as uh, you can see here, the production by aquaculture started in the 80s in a very small way but now more fish is produced by aquaculture so fish production by aquaculture in india is about 57 percent of the total production so that is becoming the major way of producing fish in india and you can see here the contribution uh, by different sectors freshwater brackish water and marine and freshwater is still the major contributor freshwater aquaculture and then um, you have brackish water aquaculture, mainly shrimp production, which is contributing mainly to exports and a small uh, marine production. And this is to show also the change um, in the shrimp culture scenario uh, over the years, because it used to be Pinace monodon initially, but now it is fully changed almost uh, to Pinace uh, Vanami. And uh, the area of aquaculture has been almost same, but the production has been increasing uh, uh, drastically after this Vanami was adopted uh, for aquaculture in India. 
Now, uh, to show about problem of resistance. Now, this is a paper we published in 1994 when aquaculture was very early stage of development. So in hatcheries, they were using antibiotics and there was mortality due to antimicrobial resistant Vibrio Harvey. So it has been recognized uh, quite early. And now if we look at uh, what is there in literature, so I searched the uh, web of science with the keyword antimicrobial resistance aquaculture India. So as you can see now the uh, it, 35 records came up and uh, the number is increasing. 2020 there were 10 publications as per web of science records. So this is slightly different when we come to Scopus, we had uh, 25 records. Again, uh, the number is increasing. And then when we come to PubMed, so there are uh, more publications because PubMed search engine also detects uh, uh, also environment related resistance. So that's why you have uh, more uh, number of uh, publications in uh, PubMed. But this shows that now researchers are also working on this. And this shows the consumption of um, antibiotics at global level uh, and aquaculture contributes less than 6% of antimicrobial use globally. And um, here there is some data in different parts of uh, the world. Um, China uh, accounted for 57.9%, uh, India 11.3%, Indonesia 8.6%. And this is similar to the uh, aquaculture production in these countries. So um, you can see how the use of antimicrobials has been taking place. Now in India, uh, policy for containment of antimicrobial resistance was developed uh, quite early, even before the WHO Global Conference uh, um, on um, Antimicrobial Resistance. So in 2011, there was a policy for uh, containment of antimicrobial resistance, so this was recognized quite early. And this recognized that uh, antibiotics are used widely in food animals as growth promoters and to prevent uh, and treat infection. So this recognized the need to control not only in uh, hospitals, but also in the animal production sector and also establish intersectoral coordination committee with experts from various sectors and regulations on the use of antimicrobials in poultry because most of these uh, meat industry is mostly for domestic consumption and uh, not uh, tightly regulated. So this um, uh, uh, action plan was followed by a national program for uh, containment of AMR 2012-2017. And then the healthcare associated institutions developed a surveillance program, network of 30 centers in collaboration with the CDC of United States. And then the National Health Policy 2017 has a component on AMR. And this calls for reduction in over-the-counter administration of drugs, restriction on use of growth promoters and pharmacovigilance. So um, at government level, there is a recognition of uh, the need to uh, improve the situation. And also India has come up with the National Action Plan on AMR 2017 to 21. And aquaculture also figures uh, in this action plan. And the Indian Council of Agricultural Research, this is a uh, wing of the ministry which uh, deals with research. So they collaborated with the FAO India and USA and set up a Indian network of fisheries and animal antimicrobial resistance, INFAR, with the two nodal institutes, one on fisheries, the National Bureau of Fish Genetic Resources, and another on veterinary uh, sciences, Indian Veterinary Research Institute, involving 15 ICR institutes, three agriculture universities, totally 20 centers, nine on fisheries and 11 on livestock. So here, a joint activity between livestock and fisheries can be seen at the initiative from the uh, ICAR in collaboration with the FAO and uh, USA. So in this project, uh, target bacteria were uh, chosen, uh, Escherichia coli, Staphylococcus aureus, including coagulase negative Staphylococci, Aeromonas and freshwater fish, Vibrio, including Vibrio parahemotic and brackish water fish. And the target species were Indian major carps and Pungaceous in freshwater, and Pinnes vanami and sea bass were the marine and brackish water uh, area. So under this program, several um, training programs and uh, meetings have been held. 
So there was a two-day training course on antibiotics and antimicrobial resistance, which was for the members, which was organized uh, from the FAO. And there was also a meeting with the poultry industry to contain uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, and how uh, intersectorial collaboration is important. Uh, was uh, emphasized and how over-the-counter use should be minimized. And of course, one issue with the AMR work is that laboratories uh, don't use the proper methodology to determine susceptibility and that will affect the results. So this was recognized and a meeting was held jointly with the uh, medical college, the Christian Medical College Velo, which is the leading medical institution. So in mostly in healthcare institutions, they have a well uh, uh, developed uh, system of uh, antimicrobial susceptibility testing. So they came together with the other institutes so that the methodology used is uh, proper and a proper uh, SOP can be developed. And this program is being monitored uh, regularly. So there is an advisory board meeting and annual meeting. So the data from this uh, project will be coming out uh, soon. And then of course the FAO uh, from Rome, uh, Melba uh, came to India and we had a workshop with farmers on minimizing antimicrobial use and antimicrobial resistance. In the NITE was involved. NITE is also one of these uh, FAO candidate centers for uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, and biosecurity. Now, when it comes to consumer, uh, it is the Food Safety and Standards Authority which has the power to regulate uh, residues. Of course, they can uh, take care of uh, consumer safety. So they come up with the regulations uh, which will affect the consumer. So they have uh, Food Safety and Standards, Contaminants, Toxins and Residue Regulation which is being continuously updated. Because I have the opportunity of working with the Food Safety and Standards Authority as a member of their scientific committee and also chair of the panel on antimicrobial use. So for fisheries, there is a regulation, antibiotics and other pharmacological active substances. So what are the antimicrobials uh, for which tolerance limits are there in India that has been specified in this uh, FSSA regulation, tetracycline, trimethoprolene and uh, oxalonic acid. And also there is a list of uh, antimicrobials which should not be used in aquaculture and uh, fish processing sector. So this is also specified in uh, this FSSA regulation. So from regulatory point of view, this is uh, very clearly available now. And the another authority that is involved uh, with the aquaculture in India is the Coastal Aquaculture Authority. So they provide registration to farms and uh, they are the regulatory authority. So what they are doing is to promote um, antibiotic free inputs like feeds for uh, aquaculture. So they are encouraging uh, feed suppliers to have their products tested. And with the test certificate, they can apply for uh, being listed in this Coastal Aquaculture Authority website. So you can see the list of aquaculture inputs approved um, certificates for standards. So, so annually they have been uh, updating the list so that um, farmers can find out what are the inputs they can use for aquaculture and which are uh, free of antibiotics. So this is a very good information for the farming community. And then the Marine Products Export Development Authority, they have the program uh, of National Residue Control Plan. This is mainly for the EU market, but this helps monitoring the shrimp farms and there is data. So they have uh, laboratory, testing laboratories in different shrimp farming areas. So they are addressing this issue of residues in uh, uh, shrimp aquaculture. And if you, India has been participating in the second uh, region consultation on monitoring antimicrobial resistance in aquaculture settings. And uh, uh, it's all, India is also participating in the uh, uh, TCP, uh, support mitigation of antimicrobial resistance in aquaculture in Asia. So in this project, uh, the target fish species are Indian major carps and fungaceous. So this project is collecting uh, antimicrobial use, baseline data through interviews and uh, target bacteria for AMR, Aeromonas and E. coli. So the expected outcome would be prudent use um, of antimicrobials in aquaculture guideline and also good aquaculture practice for target species. So there are some good aquaculture practices already developed by different institutions 
but there will be something coming out of this project based on the data that is coming out of uh, study on antimicrobial use and antimicrobial resistance surveillance. So the inception workshop was organized in December and um, uh, progress is being uh, regularly monitored. So this activity is uh, going uh, uh, on uh, track and we expect uh, the outcomes uh, on schedule. So to summarize uh, what I would like to say, India recognized the need to contain AMR and develop policy and action plan quite early, starting in 2011. And then there are different type of guidelines and uh, health policy and the uh, AMR control plan also including uh, aquaculture. And the need for intersectoral collaboration has been recognized and uh, now joint activities like the INFAR project uh, in collaboration with FAO, uh, where livestock and aquaculture are working together and in the training program, even the health sector came. So intersectoral collaboration is starting. I think this is very important to have uh, activity in uh, one health uh, area. And aquaculture figures in the national plan uh, on AMR 2017 to 21. A regulatory and laboratory support provided by the Coastal Aquaculture Authority uh, Food Safety and Standards Authority, we talked about the regulations that are there and the, um, also the program of uh, the Coastal Aquaculture Authority to provide the list of uh, antibiotic free products and the MPEDA providing uh, uh, the service of uh, monitoring the residues. And India is also participating in FAO projects and events uh, actively and regularly and uh, you hope to uh, these actions will uh, lead to uh, minimizing the use of antimicrobial aquaculture. So thank you very much uh, for your kind attention. Kapkunka, thank you very much, Dr. Itya. After we heard from uh, both countries, China and India, one of our big produce, aquaculture producers, one thing that I can observe among others is um, there, were, there are a lot of government investment in this area of work uh, to develop policy, regulation, action plan, institutional infrastructure, and also support to our small farmers to tackle with the AMR issue. This is very crucial and need a further uh, support and monitoring uh, system, strong monitoring system. Now, um, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Eduardo to, to provide um, recommendation and some uh, useful remarks for the region. Uh, Ed, are you ready? Yes, but I cannot see my... <laughs> <laughs> okay, take a little time. I, I, I cannot get rid of this. Uh, I cannot see the function of my PowerPoint. Uh, here. We can now see your PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah but I so, cannot do uh, 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 it. Uh, uh, yes. Can you click on the bottom? They have yeah, I, I, cannot, I cannot see the button because of this uh, Zoom uh, uh, Zoom taskbar. Okay, yes. can you go to the uh, begin? Begin of uh, start from the beginning, on the top, on the left, on your left. Yep, that one. Yep. Okay. 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 Good. Good. <laughs> thank right. you. Right. So thank you, Tip. I'm sorry for the technical glitch. I have to minimize my uh, taskbar. So. Basically, this uh, presentation is a continuation of what Miao has presented a while ago. And uh, to give you a backgrounder, this is uh, uh, the issues and gaps that were identified by the representative countries during the regional consultation on antimicrobial resistance risk to aquaculture in Asia, which was held way back in 2018. So this Regional consultation was conducted to identify actions and develop a strategy to address AMR risk associated with aquaculture based on an assessment of the status of AMU and AMR in the selected countries in the region. And for this presentation, 
I will be presenting uh, the major issues, gaps, and constraints that were identified during the consultation and the recommended strategies and actions for effectively addressing AMR risk. So from the uh, that consultation, this was all already mentioned by Miao, but I will give you a bit uh, details on some of which. So one of the issues, major issues and gaps that were identified is the inadequate national regulations on AMU and AMR. So as what Miao mentioned, uh, some countries already have the regulations, but the problem is on the implementation, especially at the farm level. Uh, the lack of well-trained personnel uh, that are responsible for veterinary prescription or giving advice to farmers on the proper use of antimicrobials is also uh, lacking in the region. And also on weak farm level capacity on the implementation of aquatic animal health management strategies, which can help minimize the use of antimicrobials. And the lack of public awareness on AMU and AMR, not only uh, uh, by the uh, of the farmers, but also by some of the uh, government officials that are working in the aquaculture se sector, and the lack of alternatives to ban antimicrobials and chemicals. Also, there is an inadequate emphasis on good farming management practices. Uh, specifically intended for disease prevention and limited AMR surveillance activities. These are mainly due to the lack of uh, financial as well as human resources to undertake active sur AMR surveillance in aquaculture. And if there is uh, surveillance activities, there is a lack of harmonized methodology for AMR surveillance and evaluation of antimicrobial use in aquaculture. And there is a lack of uh, or a weak scientific knowledge base on antimicrobial pathways in aquaculture and a lack of collaboration with other sectors, or, uh, for example, the livestock or the crops in dealing with the use of antimicrobials and in mitigating the uh, impacts of uh, or the risk of antimicrobials in interrelated uh, industries. And lastly, there's a lack of coordination among stakeholders along the production chain. Uh, uh, this includes the uh, processors or the post harvest and the feed meals, which sometimes they are adding antibiotics or antimicrobials on the feeds uh, and promoting it uh, to the farmers that by using that feed, that there will be, a, you know, increase in growth and uh, uh, or uh, increased resistance to diseases. But uh, nowadays, uh, antimicrobials used for as growth promoters are already prohibited. So, what are the policy recommendations that has been formulated? By, after identifying this gap, that is towards mitigating AM, AMR risk and promoting prudent use of antimicrobials in aquaculture. So the first is uh, the strengthening of uh, AMU and AMR regulations and their enforcement. So as what I uh, we have mentioned earlier, Miao and me, that some countries in the region already have existing regulations on AMU and AMR. Uh, however, there is still a need to address their appropriateness, especially at the farm level, especially on their implementation at the farm level. Also, some of these regulations do not properly address the distribution and selling of antimicrobials, uh, veterinary prescription prior to use, and the proper use and administration of antimicrobials. So, these are some of the recommend policy recommendations that uh, were formulated by the participant. This is on the proper enforcement and implementation of regulations if it is already in place. Uh, 
in the different sectors involved in aquaculture production. So we have the distributors, suppliers of antimicrobials, feed manufacturers, as well as the farmers. And provisioned by, to the farmers by the competent authority with a list of approved and banned antimicrobials and a simple guidelines, especially at the farm level guidelines for the proper use of antimicrobials uh, by the farmers themselves. And of course, inclusion of appropriate susceptibility testing to determine the correct antimicrobial in terms of the types of an antibiotics or antimicrobials to be used as well as the dosage and the duration of use that can be applied at the farm level. Sorry, I cannot read this one, but uh, uh, this is with regards to the prescription of antimicrobials in the aquaculture should be developed. Uh, use, uh, at present, uh, there is no existing guidelines on how to prescribe antibiotics or antimicrobials for aquaculture use. So for the second uh, recommendation, this is the enhancement of AMU and AMR awareness. So there should be a targeted level of awareness campaign program. So especially uh, the target should be uh, from, from the officers involved in the extension work to the farmer. So there should be a different awareness or uh, uh, yeah, campaign, awareness campaign for the different levels of uh, uh, sectors. And the training programs under the One Health Initiative should be implemented, which involves uh, human and livestock sectors. And assessment of antimicrobial use among other production sectors and stakeholders with some interactive points uh, within some interactive zones, such as the livestock and the processors, though all of these should be uh, assessed on how they used antimicrobials in their, in their production uh, or, or in, their, in the processing. And of course, we need the training of trainers for extension workers on AMU and AMR. So the third recommendation is establishing uh, um, AMU and AMR surveillance systems and mechanism. And uh, some of the recommendations are the identification of bacterial pathogens uh, and the quality control strain for each uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, disease, as well as the target cultured aquatic animals. So uh, aquaculture or the cultured aquatic animals we, uh, is very, we have a highly diverse, uh, many kinds of cultured animals and each of these cultured animals can be attacked by different pathogens. So if we will consider all of these pathogens and all the uh, cultured species in dealing with AMR, uh, I think we will not uh, come up with the concrete results on the real effect of uh, AMR in the aquaculture. So we have to identify a few target bacterial pathogens as well as the target cultured aquatic animals and focus on this to study the AMR me mechanisms in aquaculture. Uh, development of standardized or harmonized operating procedures for AMR surveillance and a standardized national list of antibiotics for testing. So, <clears throat> At this stage, um, if, if you search the literature, there's a lot of, you know, studies relating to uh, antibiotic sensitivity testing for the different uh, aquatic pathogens using a wide range of antibiotics. So, and uh, it, the end point there is you cannot compare uh, one study from the other because they are not using a standardized list of antibiotics for testing or using a standardized uh, procedures for uh, sensitivity testing. So all of these should be harmonized and standardized so that all the data that we can collect from, 
this AMR surveillance will can be compared and can be uh, analyzed accordingly. So AMR surveillance should follow the One Health Initiative by aligning analysis and results with the human data. So example for pathogens, uh, human pathogens that are present in the aquatic environment, such as uh, Escherichia coli, Staphylococcus, and Salmonella. And the human capacity development through skill training and sharing of resources and expertise on AMR. So as I mentioned, uh, at present, there is a great variation in, in undertaking AMU and AMR surveillance for the aquaculture sector in the region. And there are a few countries that are currently undertaking active AMR surveillance as what the IHUA reported in China or also in India by, reported by Karun. But and uh, the, the, the common, the, the lack of common or harmonized methodologies as well as standards with regard to the clinical breakpoints break or even the list of antibiotics that will be tested is still a challenge for some countries to undertake AMR surveillance in aquaculture. The fourth recommendation is to support the development and use of alternatives to antimicrobials. And uh, the use of antimicrobials is usually not recommended for most of the aquaculture activities, especially at the grow out culture operations. However, uh, you know, it's easy to ban uh, antibiotics and chemicals, but there are or there's limited information on the availability of alternatives to antimicrobials, which the farmers can use as a replacement for these uh, chemicals or drugs. Vaccines uh, is a very pr promising alternative, but acceptance by farmers is limited due to the high cost and limited availability in the market. So the following recommendations were formulated to promote uh, preventive measures to reduce the incidence of disease. So this includes uh, good aquaculture practices and biosecurity measures for disease prevention. So once you prevented the disease, then you will not use antimicrobials for disease treatment. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, we can explore plant-based alternatives and there's uh, one, one question also, this was mentioned by Miao, and this was answered by Melba in, in the Q&A box, and the use of uh, antimicrobial peptides. And there had been some studies already that show promising results in using antimicrobial peptides, but I think before you can apply that commercially, there should be sufficient studies to show that it is really working for uh, important aquaculture or aquatic animal pathogens that are affecting the aquaculture industry as a whole. Of course, we have the quorum sensing technology for disease inhibition and the use of other biological agents, for example, bacteriophages, which can be used as a preventive uh, to uh, viral diseases of fish and shrimps. And the use of immune stimulants, which can increase the a non-specific immune response of the aquatic animals for disease prevention. And I mentioned earlier, vaccine is very efficient, but it is prohibitive in terms of cost and its uh, you know, adoption by the farmers. So development of low cost vaccines for specific diseases is needed, is recommended so that it, the adoption of these vaccines can be uh, uh, promoted to the farmers. So we have a very successful story of vaccine in the salmon industry in Norway. But as you said, as you know, that salmon is high value fish. So how can we apply this vaccine for low value fishes, which are common, commonly cultured here in the Asia Pacific region, for example, for tilapia, catfishes and carps. So that is the main issue for vaccine. So the fifth recommendation is strengthening farm level capacity on aquatic animal health management to minimize the use of antimicrobials. So the first uh, 
uh, recommendation is to promote farmers' education and training on improved or better farm management, including the proper stocking densities to use, feeding management, waste management. So these are SOPs for uh, overall aquaculture operations, but so somehow uh, when the farmers tend to intensify culture productions, they are forgetting some of these uh, SOPs for, uh, especially for pond management. <clears throat> so the data and the information and in AMU in the aquaculture sector is are also limited. And uh, I think uh, uh, with this, the promotion of the farm level biosecurity and alternative measures in the overall prevention and management of the disease becomes a problem. So uh, farm level biosecurity is often very hard to implement, especially in the open system. You have the ponds and uh, cages or sometimes in offshore cages, but this can be, uh, uh, biosecurity can be uh, applied or applied efficiently at the hatchery or at the broodstock uh, uh, facilities. So uh, record keeping, this is one of the, I think, if, if you talk on uh, aquaculture biosecurity, record keeping is one of the key elements in uh, the implementation of biosecurity at plants. But uh, for AMU and AMR, record keeping on the total amounts of antimicrobials used as well as the duration of treatment are almost non-existent. And this is coupled with a lack of trained personnel or extension workers who can advise farmers on the prudent use of antimicrobials. So the recommendations to promote record keeping during culture operations, not only for the usage of chemicals, but also for the basic water quality parameters the amount of feeds that were given and or the overall health status of the cultured animals. And lastly, uh, to bridge the knowledge gap, there is a need to support our research activities. As I have said earlier, there has been a number of research studies undertaken on AMR. However, there are overlaps in terms of the scope and coverage which leaves significant gaps in completely understanding the impact and importance of prudent antimicrobial use and the development of AMR in aquatic animal uh, pathogens and other pathogens that are present in the aquatic environment, including human pathogens. So for the students that are attending uh, in this webinar. These are some of the research needs for AMU and AMR in the region. So one is a research on AMU, antimicrobial use, correlating with antimicrobial cross resistance. So this will give you some idea uh, of what you will propose if you, are, if you become interested in studying AMU and AMR in aquaculture, these are some of our research topic which you can propose. Of course, we also need the data analysis on the direction of transmission of AMR at a gene level. So there, there will, should be a lot of molecular studies on this to understand how the resistance is transmitted from uh, one uh, cell to another. And metabolism of persistence of antibiotics in the ecosystem. So this includes soil and water. So how long will these antibiotics or antimicrobial persist once they are discharged in the water and they are lodged in the soil? Of course, research on transferable drug resistance uh, for example, from fish pathogens to human pathogens or vice versa. Uh, research on possible coal resistance and research on withdrawal periods. Uh, this is a uh, species and ecosystem wise and also studies on the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of antimicrobials. So I think I have to end here though what we need is we continue to work together 
uh, AMR, as what said, is easy to understand, but uh, this is often misunderstood. And there's still a lot of issues and gaps that we need to fill up in understanding uh, AMU and AMR in the aquaculture sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ed, for uh, this presentation, which provides us all the uh, issue on uh, recommendation for the regulation enhancement of uh, awareness, all the way to um, development of alternatives. I think uh, this, the, especially the last one, I really like to highlight is the uh, really question to our farmers: if we ask them not to use or if wouldn't use is not possible, then we really need to stop them. What are the alternatives and they can afford to that alternative? I think this is very important issue. Now we move to, let's add, move to Q&A session. Uh, Dr. Bin Hao will moderate this session. Uh, Bin? Yeah. Yes. yes. Over to you. OK. Uh, Many thanks to each speaker for their inform uh, informative report. And we have received a lot of questions. Some of the questions have already been answered, but uh, we will select some questions for the speaker to answer or supplement. Uh, for Dr. Merba Vintasso, the question is, uh, can you give some priority actions at the national level, how to prevent or minimize AMRI in aquaculture? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, how been long time no see. Um, so in response to your question, I think that we can look at it from different perspectives. Uh, first of all, you have heard how important the national action plans on AMR, this is required by the tripartite organis uh, tripartite uh, on AMR, but, uh, and um, the different, the strategy of WHO, OIE and uh, FAO, they are looking at uh, more or less similar pillars. And one of them is um, awareness raising. Uh, this is very important and this has been uh, raised also by many of the speakers and especially in, in our sector where in we are dealing with thousands of small scale uh, producers. So how is it? Uh, what is the best way in order to reach them. And as you know, aquaculture is very site and local specific. You cannot cut and paste what you are doing in India or to another country. It has to be put in the local context, but the principles should be the same. Okay, Aware awareness raising. The other pillar in most of these strategies and action plans is the uh, surveillance of AMU and AMR. So we need to provide evidence on this aspect. The other aspect is governance, okay? Because this uh, dealing with AMR transcends uh, several uh, levels of governance from the farm level to the national level and international level because we are dealing uh, in many aspects on uh, different sectors are affected and the transboundary nature also. And also, and then the last pillar is always best practices. But um, for me, uh, they are all contained, they should all be contained in a national action plan. But for me, a very important aspect also is legislation because you know dealing with AMR has a very strong legal dimension. We also need to improve uh, knowledge base and research on many aspects already um, provided by different speakers. The other aspect is on capacity building, on also on different aspects at different levels. And the last for me is the strengthening the public-private sector partnership, because whatever systems or methodology that we are able to to do, it has to have uh, buy-in from the different, uh, especially the uh, non-state actors. And dealing with AMR and aquaculture biosecurity in general should be a um, shared responsibility for all concerned. 
So thank you very much, Hao. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Meba. And Meba have a lot of questions in the Q and A box. But for one question, and Meba has answered this question, but I think uh, maybe Dr. Green or Dr. Ewa can add something. And the question is, antimicrobial peptides is a kind of alternate antimicrobials globally. What's the scope of using this uh, natural antimicrobials in aquaculture? And uh, there, uh, there are many identified antimicrobial peptides now from plants, animals, insects, and other uh, species. Why are, they not, uh, why are we not using this kind of peptide in feed instead of the conventional antibiotics? So, Dr. Kroy, uh, can you please uh, maybe address something for this question? Okay, thanks, uh, Hao. Uh, yeah, of course, antimicrobial peptides uh, have been uh, in the field of research for quite some time. But still, we don't have them um, as a commercial product because there are probably a number of reasons why they have not yet become commercial products. So one reason could be that uh, many times people use herbal products directly. They contain some of these antimicrobial products. So instead of uh, purifying them and uh, producing a pure peptide, people are using the source bacteria directly. So maybe that is much cheaper economically because if you have to produce these antimicrobial peptides in an industrial scale, it will involve a lot of cost. So this may be one reason why it has still not uh, become a commercial product. But maybe in certain situations, there should be a possibility, uh, say for example in hatchery where the animals are in high density, uh, so the volume required may be lower compared to a farm which is several hectares. Uh, so in such situations, maybe eventually we may see, but one reason could be because of the cost involved in industrial production and the possibility of using the source material directly um, as a part of the feed uh, in aquaculture. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kroon. And uh, for Dr. Ai Hua Li, the, pro uh, the question is, uh, how big a role can antibiotic alternatives play in aquatic animal disease prevention and control? Can they really replace antibiotics to treat the fish disease? Just to follow the, the questions uh, Dr. Kroon had answered, yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hao. Uh, Many antibiotic alternatives are believed to have a positive effects on disease prevention and, uh, and the growth promotion. But uh, this effort should be, uh, should require a comprehensive approach that consi uh, considers the alternative as, as one part of the health management program. Actually, in many cases, the growth promoting effect is likely due to uh, due at least uh, in part to the product's ability to keep it or kill bacteria. At the same time, uh, preventing uh, animal disease can prevent the losses of production due to disease. Uh, generally speaking, few antibiotic alternatives are available for disease treatment than those for disease prevention and growth promotion. Potentially uh, promising pressure including uh, probiotics, uh, uh, antibacterial peptide, and uh, immuno, uh, immuno uh, mod uh, modulators, and uh, uh, bacterial phage, and uh, endolysin maybe have this function in, uh, to some, uh, some extent. However, it is uh, at, uh, antibacterial effect, uh, efficacy cannot be compared with uh, antibiotics in most cases, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And okay, next question is for uh, my colleague, um, Mr. Wei Ming Miao. The question is, Bini, uh, we all know that Bini is the FAO head uh, agriculture officer for the region, for the Asia Pacific region for a decade. In your opinion, what's the major challenge to effectively tackling AMR issue associated with agriculture on the ground in Asia Pacific? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ho, for, the, for this very 
important practical question, particularly for aquaculture people. So I, to my understanding is the AMR issue to effectively uh, address AMR issue, we need to take a multi and a holistic approach. So that includes the monitoring and the surveillance, definitely that's to provide evidence. But the key, the real key is really to address the problem on the ground at the farm operation. So if we really understand the farmers, what the capacity of the farmers, what is the major uh, interest and also the concern of the farmers and uh, then we might be better to take action on, on the ground. So give you an example. Uh, we say that the general trend of aquaculture in, in, in Asia, Asia region is intensification. Uh, however, we are, the, the farmers are probably sometimes more concerned with how to push high the yield and the stocking density, but without considering the traditional cultural facility that is largely a fish farm, where they actually can provide optimal environment for the aquatic animals to minimize different kinds of uh, diseases such as bacterial diseases. So in many Asian countries, typically the fish pond are very shallow because of the cost of construction. When you go with the very extensive farming, that's not a big problem because you don't have many animals in the pond. However, when you're double, triple the stocking density in that pond, then the things changed. Then we are also facing the challenge of climate change. What is climate change? Warming, irregularity of temperature. That will badly affect the pond condition. Temperature change, all these toxic gas, dissolved oxygen label, all those things has to take a holistic approach to think about that one. The farming practices, it's not only to manage the animal, it's to manage the environment. So what I see is basically the key is really try to, to support, to enable the farmers to really manage the cultural environment and the, the animals much, much better in the new context of climate change and intensification. Uh, if without solve that problem, there's nothing can be really achieved in terms to really to, to eliminate the AMR risk. So that, that's my, my major understanding. Just follow up on the question, just add a little bit of my thinking about the potential of use antimicrobial peptide in the aquaculture. So what I see, it's very, very challenging. In addition to the, to the problem, to the, to the constraint in the production process, but there is a, a challenge in the real application. Aquatic animals are different from, from land-based animals. When the land-based animals have a disease problem, you give directly injection. You make sure the oral administration will be really effective. The animal will take that medicine. But in the aquaculture environment system, it's unlikely to happen. So when you talk about feed additive, use the anti microbial peptide, you, you put that in a feed. But when the animals got diseased, what is the first behavior change? The feeding reduced or even totally stopped. Then you say, oh, I feed this animal. That is the problem. When we are dealing aquatic animal health management, we have to really take this uh, seriously. So I, think, I see there's a lot of, a lot of things to be done really try to, to address this issue, uh, not because this use in the other sector are very successful, then we believe they will be, they're going to work with our aquaculture, with aquatic animals. So that is my, my thinking probably, uh, we need to, vaccination probably is, is a much better alternative and also the, some other alternative treatment drugs there. Thank you, that's, that's my, uh, my kind of thinking. Thank you, back to you, Paul. Thank you for your answers, Mio. And uh, the next next question is for uh, Edward, uh, Dr. Edward. So the the two the question uh, I think there are the two very re related question. The question are uh, are there available by safety and by security guidelines 
or protocol applicable for use in the Asia Pacific region. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the question is referring to the guidelines for the use in agricultural farms facilities. And yeah, uh, yes. yeah, yeah, please. please. Yeah, actually, I already answered that in uh, my typing, uh, which is uh, there's still no uh, biosecurity or biosafety guidelines that is available in the region. But for each country in the region, they have. So they have national guidelines on aquaculture biosecurity. But how these national guidelines are implemented at the farm level is another story. So just like the AMR regulations that we have discussed, that there, that there are a lot of AMR, uh, AMU and AMR regulations, but how they are implemented at the farm level is the problem. So as I have said in, in, in my answer, uh, OIE and NACA is undertaking a project now in collecting all of these uh, biosecurity regulations, informations, or even awareness materials that are uh, implemented at the farm level from selected countries. I think we have eight selected countries in the region and uh, we are running the project at this time and hope to complete it by the end of this year. And we hope that the, the results that we can obtain from this uh, small project can be used to formulate a sort of a regional biosecurity, aquaculture biosecurity guidelines that can be uh, implemented, especially at the farm level. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Edward. Uh, I, I think uh, we can uh, have very few time to for another question. The question is very re related. Yes. It's about uh, the management program, like the GEP, GMP. Mm -hmm. uh, is there an established antimicrobial management program applicable for agricultural industry by now? No. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the GAPs and the, the GMPs that we are mentioning there is on the production side. So it's on the aquaculture production side, not, not on the use of antimicrobials. This is so the good aquaculture practices or the good management practices should be applied to prevent or minimize the use of antimicrobials. So uh, by but using antimicrobials actually is not really recommended for aquaculture, especially for the grow out culture, but for, for other, you know, uh, for example, if you are maintaining root stock, which is quite expensive, then we usually recommend the use of antibiotics whenever a disease or a bacterial disease occurs because the investment for this uh, sector, you know, maintaining root stock and for hatchery is quite big and you cannot just, you know, lose your stock but, uh, when a disease is there. But for the grow out culture operation, usually we don't recommend the use of antimicrobials or antibiotics, especially if uh, towards the later part of the culture period wherein you will don't have any withdrawal period, uh, enough withdrawal period before harvesting your product. So we don't know how much residue will be there if you continuously use antibiotics in the grow out culture. Thank you, Dr. Edward. Uh, as our time is very limited, so the rest and also the question will be uh, answered, answered by email in our rest time. And uh, so I think it's uh, it's time for our next session. Uh, uh, Hobbing, yeah. Uh, can I just add a little bit, just uh, one one minute to the question first question regarding the biosecurity uh, guideline or protocol stuff. Sure, sure, please go ahead. Uh, just re uh, add to the information, general information provided by Ed. I want to just to say, being the aquaculture officer in, in Bangkok for 12 years, we, we have seen many efforts to develop the guidelines for biosecurity control at different levels. Uh, for instance, the ASEAN, they, they developed an SOP for the, for the movement of aquatic life, aquatic animals. That is kind of biosecurity. Uh, kind of uh, guideline. And particularly for FAO in 2013, 2014, 
we had a very good collaborate, collaborative work with NACA in developing a toolkit for aquaculture management and planning. So that includes a farm level biosecurity tool. So that is particularly to, to, to advise, to provide protocol for the farmers how to really control biosecurity. So then the, the guideline was more or less completed after original consultation in 2014. Then uh, in 2017, 19, we had a regional piloting project for Indonesia. They used this uh, farm level by security guideline tool in the real application. So we also have the publication and also have the, in, that include the farm level by security tools. So this uh, information can be provided if they're, they're interest. That, that's all just, just for the amendment, thanks. Thank you, Wimmy. Okay, the next uh, session is concluding. The floor is to you, T. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bin Hao for the, uh, moderating the Q&A session. We are now in the final session of this webinar. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, have a final remarks from each panelist, start in the same sequence. Um, shall we start from Dr. Melba, please? One or two minutes each, please. Okay, so I don't know what to say. I think everything has been said by the experts, but I just wanted to emphasize the need for um, you know, continuous understanding of the subject and the sector, you know, dealing with biosecurity and aquaculture. You cannot do it on a piecemeal basis. Everything is interrelated from policy to list of pathogens, uh, risk analysis, uh, border controls, use of veterinary drugs, and so on and so forth. So you have to look at it in a more holistic approach. I saw some uh, in the uh, question and answer uh, in the Q&A, whether they are really asking for specific guidance on AMR, you have to look at it in a, a more holistic uh, approach, not just on a piecemeal basis. And we are aware that there are many guidance documents and uh, protocols that they are all scattered uh, everywhere. And with the attention that is given now to AMR, so I think there is an opportunity to put them all together in a coherent way so that our clients, especially the small scale producers can benefit you know, from this high attention, the available resources and the, what really needs to be done at the farm level, which, is, which seems to be the most uh, um, challenging task ahead of us. So that's from my, and FAO, as you know, we, we can provide technical assistance to our member states uh, on different aspects, as long as there is a, um, an official request from the government. And we are always ready to assist our members and other stakeholders. Thank you very much and continue feeding us with your knowledge on, at the ground level on AMR. Uh, over to you, uh, Tip. Thank you, Melba. Miao. Uh, thank you, uh, Tip. Uh, many things have already been said, so I just want to highlight or re-emphasize some, some really, really important issues. So first, AMR is an issue of great importance, but also great challenge to aquaculture sector in the Asian Pacific. So, uh, we need a collaboration between the animal health people and the aquaculture people, don't? Because currently I see in most exercise process are mainly the aquatic animal health people are engaged, but not with much participation of the aquaculture people. So that is not going to work. So they need to work jointly. Then secondly, the AMR associated with aquaculture is substantially different from livestock sector and crop sector. Because currently we can see generally the AMR work are mainly led by these livestock people. So when we work with them, they need to get them understand. The aquaculture environment, the aquaculture organisms, they are very, very different. So we have to take this consideration when they, whenever they develop the, the 
the guideline, the, the action plan, they have to consider this characteristic of the, of the sector. And uh, for the agricultural people, we need to understand to address the AMR is not only to ensure the public health, but it's also to make sure the sector will maintain its sustainability. We need to avoid a situation we have no drugs, effective drugs to use to, to cure the, the, the microbial really cause diseases. Then uh, to tackle the AMR issue on one, on one hand, we need to focus on the home, how to contribute to the overall One Health environment, the human. Then on the other hand, we need to safeguard our sector in, in the long term. So again, I want to say the key to the effective tackling AMR issue uh, in the aquaculture is really to help the farmers to effectively manage the health uh, and disease problem of our animals. Uh, well, I don't agree with, with what Ed has said. If the, the, the fish, grow out fish pond is infected with bacteria, so we cannot use, no way we can use the antibi antibiotics. I don't think that's, that's the re not the reality. Uh, you cannot really convince the farmers say, you have to stop using any, any drugs because uh, the, there's a risk there, unless we can provide them good alternatives. So uh, that is what I, I want to say. And, and another last point is currently, it seems to me, the work on the, of the AMR in, in the initial stage is too much focused on, on the monitoring and the surveillance. That is important. That provides evidence to everybody to understand the problem. But we need to pay equally, at least equally, attention to the root causes, how to solve the problem on, on the ground. Otherwise, the situation will not change significantly. Thank you very much. Back to you, Steve. Thank you. Next, um, Dr. Ekwa. Please unmute. Please unmute your microphone. Yes, now yeah, yeah, you yeah. have to start again. Yeah, yeah. okay. China's agriculture has adjusted its development goals from increasing production to improve quality. So we can see that China's regulation on aquatic inputs is becoming more, more and more stricter. And however, strict supervision cannot solve the economic losses caused by disease, especially uh, considering that there are too many small uh, producers, which become the difficulty of supervision. So there, there is a still a long way to go to truly reduce the use of antimicrobials in all in the all along the way. Reducing the use of antimicrobials uh, antimicrobials in aquaculture and reducing the residue of antimicrobials in aquatic products are the most effective measures to reduce the spread of MR from agriculture to, to human beings. However, a contradiction between reducing the use of antimicrobials and ensure animal health must be solved, which requires a comprehensive application of various technologies, including a good, good husbandry and uh, and the antibiotic alternatives and the biosecurity technologies. In addition, we are promoting the prudent use of antimicrobials. It is more important to promote the collective use of antimicrobials to ensure their efficacy and make every use play it is due low, including select collected uh, antibiotics using uh, adequate dosage and the treatment courses and the make effective Deliver message. Uh, this is my, this is my remarks. My remarks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Doctor Ija. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, as um, we heard from different speakers, uh, there is a lot of work going on in the region in different countries, and people are looking at uh, antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial use and more and more data is coming. Then of course we need to see 
what is the message we can give to consumers? So should consumers be scared to eat fish? Of course, if we look at some of the publications, there were a couple of publications which projected a picture as if fish, fish is full of antibiotics. But of course, that is still not true. Um, and when you look at uh, resistance, what I would like to say is that uh, uh, resistance is something which you will find wherever you seek. People have found it in uh, frozen material, which has been frozen for millions of years, even before use of antibiotics. So resistance is there. Of course, use of antibiotics has enriched this. And uh, of course, it's not to say that you know, there is no problem. But of course, there is a problem, yes, uh, but it is not still come to an extent where the consumers need to be scared of eating fish. Uh, this is uh, evident from the data on both the residues as well as resident, uh, resistance. And one good thing that uh, we can uh, recollect about aquaculture and fish is there are very few zoonotic bacteria which are transmitted from fish to humans. So unlike terrestrial animals, so terrestrial animals like cattle, poultry, so they have as commensals on their body, pathogens like salmonella, then uh, enterotoxin E. coli, which are normally present in the animals. If they become resistant, then of course the disease can be transmitted to humans. Fortunately, in aquatic species, there are very, very few zoonotic bacteria of this type. So this is another good thing for from the fish safety point of view. But of course, we need to take measures uh, to minimize the use because aquatic environment becomes a reservoir. So because uh, the resistant organisms selected from all sectors, say from hospitals or from farms, they end up in the aquatic environment. Then they finally reach aquaculture. So what you find in an aquaculture farm may not be the result of antimicrobial use directly in the farm, but maybe coming from so many other sectors. So we need to be aware of this also. That's where, of course, you know, also said we need to work uh, together with all sectors to minimize the use. And we see this happening uh, in country this, uh, in this region. And I'm sure uh, with more awareness and more uh, data coming and more uh, government awareness and policy changes, the situation will improve and we will have uh, safe fish to consume for all uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the last one, Dr. Ed. Oh, thank you, Tip. So the disadvantage of being the last one to talk is all the important points have been raised. But I think I will uh, focus more uh, more on the theme of this webinar. That is, uh, AMR is easy to understand, yet it is often misunderstood, which I totally agree. Yes, AMR is a simple topic to understand theoretically, but considering the complexity of the aquaculture sector, this often leads to the misunderstandings of AMU and AMR uh, in aquaculture in general. So as what Nyao mentioned, so I will uh, also uh, supplement what Nyao mentioned. Aquaculture is a totally different and quite complex and diverse uh, sector. So compared to the other food producing sectors, including the livestock or crops. So for one, we have hundreds of cultured animals, aquatic animals composed of different groups. We have fin fish, we have crustacean, mollusk, and uh, uh, even amphibians. And they are cultured in a variety of environments. We have freshwater, brackish water, and marine, wherein if you deal with AMR, you should be dealing them uh, independently because bacterial pathogens will be different at this different aquatic environment. And they are cultured in uh, different culture systems. We have extensive, semi-intensive, and even hyper-intensive or super-intensive systems. And lastly, they are cultured in an open system such as ponds or cages or in a closed recirculating system such as the RAS. And to top, and to top that, uh, the aquatic environment in general can be considered as the pit, the final pit of all the antimicrobials and chemicals uh, that are washed out as waste. And such waste do not only come from the aquaculture itself, but 
most often than not from other sectors such as the livestock or even from humans. Thus understanding AMR in aquaculture in or the use of antimicrobials in aquaculture is not as easy as one, two, three. But in fact, there had been a lot of efforts in the aquaculture sector to reduce the use of antimicrobials, especially for those uh, species that are cultured for export. Because once even a tint of residue is detected in this processed aquaculture products for export, they they can result to rejection of consignments by the importing countries around the world. Thus, it is still important that AMR in activities in aquaculture be coordinated fully with other industrial sectors, as well as along the whole production or supply chain of aquatic products. At present, this is somehow achieved by uh, through the tripartite agreement of uh, World Health Organization, OIE, and FAO, on the One Health Initiative in all of the sectors that I have mentioned has to really work together in minimizing antimicrobial use. Or if they are used, it should be used prudently. I know this is easier said than done, um, but each, I think each little step that we take in achieving this will definitely have a big impact in the future. And NACA, will certainly continue supporting any initiative on AME and AMR in the region for the aquaculture sector, as this is one of the keys for the sustainability of the industry and in the production of safe and high quality aquatic products for human consumption. So we, don't, we should not stop here. Let us continue to work together for a better or prudent antimicrobial use and in continuously mitigating the risk or the impacts of antimicrobial resistance in the aquaculture industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. We should not stop here. So this uh, webinar is just an appetizer and order to, for everyone engaged in this uh, topic. On behalf of the AFIC Secretariat, I would like to thank you all participants, our panelists, InfoFish colleague and many people behind the scene for making this webinar happen. Uh, I, I would like to keep the floor to InfoFish just in case InfoFish will have any announcement or anything to close this uh, webinar. We have half minute. Thank you. <laughs>